Mark chapter 16. Let's read the word of the Lord together. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But as they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Do not be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. It's the word of the Lord. We do thank God for his word. And I want to ask you a question. It's a rhetorical question because I'm going to answer it in a second. What is the most important doctrine in all of Scripture? What is the single theological fact, single theological concept, single historical truth taught by Scripture that is central to everything else? It's an interesting question. If you had to pick one doctrine that would be the hill on which you die, so to speak, what would it be? It's a bit of an unfair question because there are two theological facts and more than that, historical facts in scripture that are twins. They go with one another. The death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus died for our sins. It was a demonstration of God's love for us. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sin. God demonstrates his love to us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Just as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, so the Son of Man was lifted up. And as we look upon him, we are saved. Jesus died for our sins. That's central. Without that fact, we are lost. There is no hope for humanity because, as Scripture tells us, there is only one name given by which we may be saved. Jesus Christ. But I want to focus on the second of those twins. Yes, the birth of Jesus' death, that theological fact, was first. That is the firstborn fact chronologically. But there have been many martyrs who have died for their causes. There is only one risen Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is for me the single most important thing I want to talk about. That's the single most important thing I want to tell others about. As we talk about the death and resurrection of Jesus, we talk often about the death. How many of our songs are rich with the imagery of God's love poured out on the cross? And how often does the resurrection of Jesus form the afterthought? Let's focus on the resurrection this morning. And we are going to see how that fact changes everything. We're going to focus on one single verse, or uh, just the climactic comments of Peter in 1 Peter, and see how the resurrection of Jesus brings such richness to our lives when we understand it and we trust in it. There's a song, and you may have sung it this morning. This is our Easter service, our Resurrection Sunday service. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how, I know he lives. Before I finish the lyric, I always struggle a bit with this song. Not because it's not true, it's absolutely true. 
But the, those final words are only part of the truth. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Now that is an absolutely true statement. If you belong to Jesus, we are told very clearly in Scripture that those who belong to Christ have the Spirit of Christ. He lives within us. But Jesus does not merely live inside your heart. And I want to, we need to be clear on this. Because in a world where the subjectivity of truth is right in the front, where we live our truths, that's the message of our culture, 21st century North America. Truth has become subjective. What is true for you? That song that says, Jesus lives in my heart, while it is absolutely true, is only part of the reality that Jesus is alive. Historically, he lives. That is an objective reality. You know, in a lot of ways, the New Testament is harder on itself than it needs to be. If the apostles wanted to dream up a religion that was easy to swallow, why not have the resurrection of Jesus be a merely spiritual reality. You don't need a physical Savior. Why don't we just have a spiritual Savior? Jesus returns as some spiritual entity. He ascends to a higher plane and comes back as a, as a, as a, as a benevolent spirit. But that's not the message of Scripture. Jesus was alive. He walked with them. That's not a metaphor. Let me read to you from the book of Luke, and I think this is very important for us to remember. Jesus' story did not end with the resurrection, and he goes back up into the clouds, and no one ever sees him again. Jesus walked with them. Remember what we just read in Mark? He said, I am going ahead of them into Galilee, and they will see me there. On that same day, the women found the tomb empty, and they were given this message that Jesus is not here, he is risen. There were a few disciples taking a bit of a day trip. Let me read to you from Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you, the only, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and don't know the things that have happened here in these days? What things? He asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But he had, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road? And open the scriptures to us. 
They got up, returned at once to Jerusalem, and there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and said, It is true, the Lord has risen, and he has appeared to Simon. Then the two, two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. They talk about the burning in their hearts, that subjective experience. But there was a man who walked with them on the road. And notice that he says, you need to understand what Scripture has spoken about this Messiah. Jesus points back to the Old Testament. The Old Testament established the expectation of a living king, a living Messiah. Listen to what Isaiah says. And remember, Isaiah is key to building this messianic expectation, this savior of Israel, this servant of the Lord who's going to come rescue his people. This is what Isaiah wrote about him. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and his peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it, upholding it with justice, righteousness, from that time and forever. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. The establishment of this king will be a reigning rule which will last forever. Isaiah 53 talks about the suffering of the servant. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before the shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the living, and the transgressions of my people, for my, the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor, 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 was, no any, <laughs> nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. He showed them from Scripture the suffering of God's chosen servant. And through that suffering, the glory he would enter. Do you understand how important the resurrection was? We don't just need someone to die for us. We need a living Savior. In the book of John, it is very clearly established that Jesus promises life beyond death. Hope beyond this life. When Lazarus has died, Jesus arrives and he speaks to Lazarus' sisters. And Martha says, I know he will rise again, speaking of her brother Lazarus, at the resurrection, at the last day. But Jesus says to her, and listen to what he promises to Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Do you hear the absurdity of Jesus' statement? If he has promised life to those who believe in him, even life that can conquer death, and yet he himself is dead, why would we hope in a dead Savior? Why would we look for life in one who he himself could not bring life? In some ways, the mocks and taunts of those who looked up at him on the cross, if he is God's chosen one, let him come down from the cross. If he is the one who is bringing life and hope to Israel, let him come down. Let him save himself. 
There is truth to that. If Jesus cannot himself find life, how can he give life to others? Do you understand why this needs to be the central reality for us as Christians living today? Yes, Jesus died, and his death means our sins are dead and buried. But he is alive. If you have missed through all of this the centrality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Paul makes it absolutely crystal clear in 1 Corinthians 15. Let me read for you 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 17. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Do you hear where Paul puts the resurrection of Jesus Christ? It is at the very center of of the gospel. If it is true, everything else changes. If it is false, Christianity itself is false. You know, when I have conversations with people about whether the Christian faith is true, there are any number of things people may object to. There are any many number of things that are found in Scripture that people cannot accept. But I don't want to talk about them. I want to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you know why? Recently I saw on social media a post about Noah's Ark and how this story is so absurd and how it essentially undermines the truth of any, any confidence we can have in Scripture. That single story in Scripture, it can't possibly be true, so why on earth do we still keep reading this book and thinking that it has some objective truth to it? That it is historical. That it is meaningful. But can I point something out to you? If Jesus is alive, what is so absurd about the idea of a flood? What is so absurd about the idea of God miraculously bringing salvation and judgment into a world to deal with sin? If Christ is alive, if he can raise the dead, surely he can make it rain. On the other hand, if we have misunderstood certain elements of Scripture, let's say, for example, that I have gotten the historicity of Job and Jonah wrong. That I have understood some passages that were poetical to be historical and some that were historical to be parabolic or just pro, just a beautiful story to teach us something. I can still be saved so long as I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who has come into the world, who has died for my sins. And in fact, in seeing him risen, alive. I can now have faith that Job and Jonah were meant to point me to him. I'm not saying those details don't matter. Absolutely they matter. We should look into them. We should, with confidence, search Scripture, trusting that God will teach us the truth of Scripture. But this is the central truth. Jesus is alive. And while I can't, I, we can point to all sorts of archaeological and historical evidences or arguments for the, the flood of Noah or the life of Job. Peter and Paul both died confident they had met the living Jesus. And their confidence inspires me. I know in whom I have believed. That is a huge long preamble. Jesus is alive. 
the message of the angel on that resurrection sunday was he is not here he is risen how does that change us well now we're finally getting to our text if you have your bible with you turn to first peter chapter 5 first peter chapter 5 verses 10 and 11. And I want you to listen. Now remember, we've had a few themes going on throughout 1 Peter. So let me review some of those themes for you. Three things in particular I want to point out that we've seen over and over in 1 Peter. First, remember that 1 Peter points out we belong not to this world, but to the kingdom of heaven. We are, as Peter begins the letter, God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, and we are those who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling by his blood. And because we belong to that other world, our hope is not in this world. Remember, praise be to God, Peter continues, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. We don't belong to this world and our hope resides with Christ. We are looking forward to that hope. If you want to see that, it comes up over and over again. As we've seen already in 1 Peter 1, 4, we find it in 1 Peter 1, 17, 1 Peter 1, 23, uh, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, 1 Peter 5, 12 to 13. Over and over again, this message is repeated. Second, because we don't belong to this world, we are going to be persecuted. We are going to undergo trial and difficulty. But that trial and difficulty is meant for our good and God's glory. Peter talks about grief through all kinds of trials in 1 Peter 1. He says in verse 7, These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by the fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. We enter into trial because we don't belong here. And the world is antagonistic to us as children of heaven. We see again that over and over again. 1 Peter 1, 6-9, 2, 11, and 12. 20, uh, and then 23 and 25 as well. 3, 13 to 16. 4, 1 to 5. 4, 19. 5, 8 to 11. And finally, and this is a theme that we need to get to. This is where Peter takes us to. Jesus has laid down a sure path for us to follow. As we trust God and follow in him, we are faithfully bearing witness to the truth of our Savior as we put our trust in him. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your souls. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they excuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Those three themes have been wound throughout this book. And now we come to the climax. In my opinion, this is sort of the summary statement as Peter wraps up the letter and it is found at the end of the letter, just before the sign-off. Peter writes, 1 Peter 5, verses 10 and 11, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Now, I want you to read that and listen to that in light of the fact that Jesus is not dead. He is alive. Think about the richness of these promises if Jesus is alive. First, and the God of all grace. Grace, God doing for us because of who he is, doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves and what we do not deserve. All of that grace comes from God. We can't go outside of Jesus and find grace because all of God's grace comes through Christ. It is by him that we have access to that throne room of God, that we can stand in his presence, no longer outsiders, no longer those under judgment, but as children dearly loved. The God of all grace is ours in Christ, and he proves it by the resurrection. He is the one who has called you to his eternal glory. Think about that. The reward we have, the reward that is guaranteed by the fact that Jesus is alive, is an eternal glory. It is not some small, dingy thing. It is not some trinket. It is a glory that will last 
And that is what we are being called to. Because Jesus is alive, he is guaranteed that that's what waits for us. It will not perish, it will not spoil, it will not fade. We have been called to an eternal glory. After you have suffered a little while, he himself will restore you. Because Jesus is alive, your trial and your trouble right now, your suffering is not the end of the story. Do you hear how important that is? Whatever you're going through right now, Jesus is alive. And I tell you with confidence, whatever it is you're wrestling with, whatever you're struggling with, this is not the defining reality of your story. The living Christ is the defining truth of your story. If you belong to him, these troubles, these trials will one day become the fuel for your passion as you sing to God about all he has done for you. And do you know why I say that with confidence? Because Jesus is alive. So when you're in the middle of the darkness, when the cloud surrounds you, remember that though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you need not fear any evil because he is with you. His rod and his staff, they comfort you. The shepherd who walks with you, even death could not keep him from you. Even death could not separate us from his love. He has conquered the worst and now he walks with us. And after you have suffered a little while, he himself will restore you. He will make you strong. Do you need strength? The risen Christ has the power to bring strength to weak limbs. To give strength to the quailing heart. He himself can make you strong. He will make you firm and steadfast. Are you in danger of slipping, to giving way, to abandoning all hope? The one who prayed in the garden, the one who had what looked like sweat drops of blood pouring from him in the heat of his prayers, Lord, I don't want to face this, but your will be done. That one who was so steadfast and immovable, who went through the death and entered into the glory of life, the firstborn over creation, he can make you strong. To him be the power forever and ever. What powers are at work in your life right now? What powers are at work around you? They will fail if they are not his power those forces that struggle against him, they will not succeed. They may have their moment in the sun. They may have this short period and season where they are allowed to run free. But to him be the power forever and ever. They cannot conquer Christ who has already conquered death. You see, the resurrection of Jesus is not just a piece of theological trivia. It will shape everything you see, everything you feel, everything you do, if we will trust in him, the living Christ. Over the last number of months, as we've gone through this COVID pandemic season, I've been spending some intentional time talking with some folks, making sure that I am healthy and well, that as we discuss, as we walk through this season, it's been very stressful and trying. There's been a few counselors who've been so close to me. One in particular who's been helping me see the world as it is, not how my mind would make it to be. Not the lies that are whispered in my ear, the poison that is poured in my ear as if some Shakespearean villain were seeking to destroy my life. You see, we buy into the lies. Jesus is alive. Do you believe it? Remember what John said. John says, I give you this testimony. 
John the Elder, John the one who lived his whole life looking back and remembering the fact that he saw the living Christ. He touched the resurrected Jesus. It was not some ethereal, spiritual idea. It was a man who ate with them, who walked with them, who talked with them, and who promised he was coming back for them. John said, I have communicated these things. I have recorded these things for you so that by believing in him, you may find life. I pray that you have found life. And if you haven't found that, Jesus is alive. And he receives all who come to him in repentance and faith. Let today be the day.